Well, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Chow. I'm the director of the San Jose State High School. Uh, if you hear any squeaking or barking or whining, uh, my apologies, but my dogs want to be part of the symposium as well. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome to our celebration and recognition of Black History Month. The theme of our symposium is shaping the future together, how libraries can support communities of color. And this is part of our new equity and diversity and inclusion series sponsored by the iSchool. George Floyd was killed on May 25th, 2020 in Minneapolis, and his death sparked national referendums and the call for needed social reforms. He was also from Fayetteville, North Carolina, whose public library system I had ironically developed a strategic plan for the year before in 2019. At the time of his death, I was the faculty senate chair at UNC Greensboro, and I worked very closely with our chancellor, Frank Gilliam. And on behalf of the faculty, we sent his family flowers along with a note to his family and his then six-year-old daughter that we were committed to making a difference and to deliver on our chancellor's promise and request to all of us to do something. As someone who's experienced discrimination all of my life and seeing it occur with my three children as well, I'm committed to trying to do something and make a difference, which is why the high school has created this EDI symposium series as a tangible attempt to live up to that promise to George Floyd and his family and to try and stop this cycle of hate and violence towards one another due to color of our skin. That we will work towards a more equitable and less racist future for his children and for us all. And that we wish to emphasize and highlight that we are much more similar as Americans in our mutual belief in our democratic principles and pursuit of a higher quality of life. That we are different as we that we are different as defined by the color of our skin and other differences largely driven by stereotypes led by ignorance and intolerance that divide us. In talks of our state librarian, both in North Carolina and now in California, we're all in agreement that our field and our nation's libraries have a role in helping heal these divides, to educate and to inform, to serve as a safe space to discuss these complex issues that we must face and figure out together. This is why I'm sincerely grateful for the amazing guests that we have uh, that are joining us today. So let me start by introducing everyone uh, and then we will begin with our keynote uh, speakers. So let me introduce first Julius Jefferson, past ALA president and the section head of the research and library services section in the foreign affairs, defense and trade division, uh, congressional research service of the Library of Congress. Next is Janae Brown, a new friend, uh, president of the California Library Association and the associate director of engagement and outreach at Los Angeles Public Library. Forrest Foster, associate professor and assistant dean of library services, uh, FD Blueford Library, North Carolina a and University, and he will be talking about outreach on an academic campus. And Brian Hart, director of Forsyth County Public Libraries, and he will be discussing public library outreach and support for African-American communities. Wanda Brown, good friend and fellow troublemaker, past ALA president and director of library services at Winston-Salem State University, and she'll be talking about embedded social justice. Shannon Jones, director of libraries, uh, Medical University of South Carolina, uh, and also president-elect of the Medical Library Association, and she'll be talking about medical related outreach efforts. And last but certainly not least, Yolan Wilburn, a graduate of San Jose State's high school and new director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries and also fellow CLA uh, board member. And she'll be talking about best practices in serving the black community. So without further ado, uh, we are going to hand it to Julius Jefferson uh, and Janae Brown. Oh 
Alfredo, and thank you, everyone. I want to uh, start this off um, for on behalf of Janae and I by just saying uh, thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, thank you to the panelists, to the staff to put this whole thing together uh, virtually in Zoom, uh, and, and those who are joining us today. Uh, it's certainly an honor and a pleasure uh, to be able to speak to all of you today um, on what is uh, Black History Month. Um, we, we started off by hearing uh, the Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is a African-American spiritual written by the, the Johnson brothers, Jay Weldon and Jay Rosemont. And um, I wanted to start off with that because, you know, I think today you're going to hear Janae and I talk about um, from whence we came and how we got to be in a place where we can even come before you and share our ideas and thoughts about librarianship, certainly librarianship to the Black community. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't just, you know, start off by paying homage to the, the great Carter Godwin Woodson, who is the founder of what we now know as Black History Month, but certainly Negro History Week, uh, going back to 1926. Um, I, certainly, uh, my life has crossed paths with, with Dr. Woodson's in a couple of ways. I know one, uh, certainly Dr. Woodson being a phenomenal scholar um, at one point in time, uh, before he uh, before he actually was the dean and, and chair of the history department at Howard University, where I graduated from, um, he uh, he actually uh, taught in D.C. public schools, uh, principal at Armstrong High School. Um, but more importantly, he set the tone um, for the African Center perspective in, in history uh, when he was at Howard, and he went on to do that um, when he started what is now called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History in 1915, and that continues. Um, you know, the theme uh, this year for Sala is definitely Black uh, health and wellness. I think that's a very fitting theme because uh, amidst the things that you just heard Dr. Chow talk about over the past couple of years is something that we can all identify with. Um, so uh, with that, I want to open it up to Janae. Um, she's going to share some thoughts uh, opening up and she's going to share a poem. Janae. Thank you, Julius. Thank you so much. And it's good to see everyone. I do want to start with a poem to help uh, set the tone. You know, families are very important to me and uh, my ancestors are my superheroes. And when I read this poem from um, Nikki Giovanni, it just really resonated 
with me and it's called I Am a Mirror. And it's from the book entitled I Am Loved, which is illustrated by Ashley Bryan, one of my favorite artists. Uh, so as a former children's librarian, thank you for indulging me in this. I am a mirror. I reflect the grace of my mother, the tenacity of my grandmother, the patience of my grandfather, the sweat of my grandmother, my great grandmother, the hope of my great grandfather, the songs of my ancestors, the prayers of those on the auction block, the bravery of those in the middle passage. I reflect the strengths of my people and for that alone, I am loved. So thank you very much for listening to that. It definitely is a testament to my esteemed reverence of my family and it reflects the way family can be seen through us. And I just absolutely love the way I feel um, after reading this poem. And thank Julius. you, Janae. So, so, every, so I want everyone to know, this is gonna be a conversation. Um, we, we are sharing this, this uh, space today um, as a team and we're gonna have a conversation and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a few things. Um, one of the things we're gonna talk about certainly is how we got here. Uh, we're gonna talk about our ancestors. Um, but before I jump into that, uh, Janae, I want to ask you, what does Black History Month mean to you? Yeah, Black History Month is this time of the year. Actually, fe February is my, my uh, favorite month. My parents were uh, married on February 29th. And uh, for me, for Black History Month, it really means a time of sharing stories, a time of learning, a time of elevating Black achievement and accomplishments and contributions. And uh, even though it's just the 28 or 29 days, if we're in the leap year, um, Black history to me is celebrated 365. But this month, more than ever, is when we put the spotlight um, on our accomplishments. And Absolutely. what does it mean for you, Julius? Absolutely. I agree with every, everything you just said. I, and I, I'll just just, you know, touch on the fact that it's, it, it's a time for us in, to reflect uh, upon the accomplishments of African-Americans to uh, what we call this experiment of America. Uh, oftentimes, we are, have just not been included in the narrative. And it's an opportunity just to remind us so we can continue the other uh, 11 months of the year to highlight and, and hold high uh, all of our accomplishments. And then, and, and then begin to, to, begin to uh, sort of see the ties, to see how, in fact, um, you know, some of the things our ancestors did um, allowed us to have some of the accomplishments and sort of keep uh, keep the struggle moving forward, because I, I, I think we can all acknowledge it's a continual struggle. Um, had it not been for our ancestors, Janae, uh, then I don't think you and I would be able to be here and many, many of us in this space. So with that being said, I want you to talk a little bit about your ancestors and, you know, what were their challenges? Um, what were their opportunities? You know, how, how did your ancestors shape who you are today? Good, good question. Um, so I call my, my ancestors my superheroes, right? Um, my grandfather, if it were not for my grandparents, both maternal and maternal grandparents, deciding that they would leave the South and come to Los Angeles, Janae Brown probably would not be sitting before you as the president of CLA. So my, grand, my grandfather, uh, was born in Prescott, Arkansas. And uh, as you can imagine, he was born in 1916. And as a young man, uh, he had seen a lot, faced a lot of degradation, humiliation, discrimination. And um, the, as the story goes, and our family got fed up and refused to step off the sidewalk to let a white man that was in, coming in his direction and from the opposite direction. And then, you know, there's some words were exchanged. And in essence, he was told, you know, you better get out of the town before sun, sundown kind of thing. And being a train porter, his father as well, um, he got on the train and, and headed out west and had to leave his wife and five children behind. Um, shortly thereafter, my grandmother packed up the car, um, 1955 Oldsmobile, I hear and um, 
uh, said goodbye to friends and family, which was a difficult decision. You know, she um, had a hairstyling business. She was a beautician and had a business there and just had to um, leave all of that behind to seek better opportunities for the family. And um, in 1957, they arrived in Los Angeles. And coincidentally, on my father's side, that family too left Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1956 and headed um, out, out to Los Angeles. And so um, I applaud my grandparents for taking those bold steps um, not knowing what they would face in Los Angeles. Certainly when they got here, there were some discriminatory practices and redlining that, that they were faced with here. Um, but they all set, all four of my grandfathers were entrepreneurs and were homeowners and believed in education. And, um, you know, although they didn't make it past high school, they instilled that, um, the 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 love of education, the need for education to put their grandchildren on an equal playing field. I remember my grandfather saying that that is the one thing that no one could ever take from you is your education. And so that has stayed with me many years during college when I wanted to give up. And um, it was just the, the wind beneath my wings from him supporting me and, and saying that and, and instilling in me like, you can't give up, you know, you certainly didn't face what they faced, right? And so um, I, I just strongly believe and feel like I owe it to them to be excellent and to be great. Yeah, that's an outstanding story. I think many people can relate uh, to that story. And we all have uh, a story to tell. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly share um, the saga of, of from whence I came, um, coincidentally, uh, my mother and my father's family both come from the same place, maybe 10 miles apart. They didn't know it. And this goes back 150 years ago. Um, but my father being an archivist and a genealogist, um, we were able to do research along with my, uh, my, um, my, 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 my grandfather, my, my, um, my mother's father. We were able to find out how we intersected it just 120 miles from Washington, D.C. And so long story short, on my father's side, um, we're descended from a lady named Elizabeth Hemming. She was a matriarch of the of the uh, forced labor camp. Uh, we now call Monticello uh, in Albemarle County, Virginia. That that was the home of the third president. Uh, she her 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 third child and second daughter um, is my sixth grade grandmother. Her name was Elizabeth Hemings as well, named after her mother. And she also uh, at some point became the, the matriarch of the forced labor camp. And so um, it wasn't until maybe 25 years ago that we really unraveled the full story. So it takes a long, a long time to really find out just because of the history that we have, a lot of the documents weren't available. Um, I was fortunate because um, my ancestors came from uh, that particular uh, forced labor camp. Uh, that there, there was documentation. And so I think it's imperative when we, when we think about um, Black History Month, um, we, we think about the research that goes into it. When you talk about your family, Janae, I thought about the work that Carter G. Woodson did um, with, with the Great Migration. I mean, yeah. he, 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 he was the, the individual that sort of laid this out and told us the story. Later on, um, a great scholar named Spencer Crew uh, continued that idea of the Great Migration uh, from field to factory at the Smithsonian. So I think about these stories are there and we have to go out and do the research. So the research was done uh, through a, a many individuals uh, searching my, my ancestry. Um, I tell you one quick story is that um, my, I think it's my fifth great grand, my fifth great uncle um, actually uh, built uh, uh, and packed the books uh, that the Library of Congress purchased from the third president. Um, and help transport those books um, to, uh, to the Library of Congress. And they're on display, part of Jefferson's uh, collection. Um, so there's a direct lineage there uh, with my ancestors and the Library of Congress. But I think we all have these stories, you know, and that's important that we think about that during this time, during this month, that we think about our stories. We should be thinking about it all year round, but especially now because uh, of the work of, 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 of Carter G. Woodson. 
sort of like highlighting it and then putting us into this context, this, this American context. So with that being said, um, Janae, I'm going to ask you, so based on what you said about your family, um, you know, they certainly were, were brave and bold, uh, you know, leaving the South, venturing West. Um, who will be the beneficiary of your courage? Ooh, love that question, um, because you're absolutely right. I stand on, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And per, on a personal level, I would have to say it would be my three daughters, right? So they get to see their mother um, graduate from uh, library school and then ascend through the ranks at Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm showing them a great example of the courage, but also the, the colleagues that I work with, um, the folks that I get to lead and the folks that I get to learn from in my institution and in associations that I belong to. And then definitely the public that, that I serve um, because I'm serving as an advocate, as a voice for them um, by having a seat at the table and making decisions on collections and programming and other services at the library. Um, and so I would say those three categories, those three groups, um, and I'll, I'll bounce it back to you and want to hear your thoughts on who would be the beneficiary of your courage. And I, I agree with what you just said. Certainly um, our, our, our descendants, right? Certainly our children and those who will come after us. Um, but I think that, you know, as we are going to sort of talk a little bit about our profession and service to people of color, I think we absolutely have an obligation um, to serve and to share and to pass down and to be an activist for uh, our community, you know, writ large. And I think that, um, you know, we have to be that example because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. We have to be that example in this moment more than ever um, because it, it only takes a second for us to go back 150 years. I know we don't, we don't think it can happen, but certainly if, you take, if you're paying close attention, it, it can happen. And so, um, you know, we have to be here for those who come, who are going to be coming after us. And we have to mentor those who are coming up now. And hopefully, you know, those who are coming up now will listen to us because uh, I think that we've seen some things. Uh, certainly in our communities, we've seen some things uh, um, in our profession. Um, and that leads me to this question, Janae, why librarianship? Yeah, that journey to librarianship, it, it took me a little while to get there. I thought I wanted to be a, a elementary school teacher and then a si child psychologist. I actually majored in psychology at UC Santa Cruz. And um, but at, during my work at uh, or during my college years at UC Santa Cruz, of course, I had work study right to help pay through for college. And was hired to work in the reserves department at McHenry Library. And during my time there, there was a new librarian that came on board. Her name was Vivian Sykes, and she was deemed the multicultural librarian. And through my tenure there, we would talk, we would engage in conversations. And as any good activist librarian will do, she tried to recruit me to the profession. And I said, no, 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 Vivian, I'm going to be a child psychologist. You know, I'm just do doing this library work just to help pay for college. But she saw something in me, right? And, and kept pressing and giving me information about library school and all of this good stuff. And I graduated and went into um, social work for a little bit. That got to be too challenging, challenging and stressful for me. And I thought like, what could I really do to help individuals, you know, to lift up folks, to give folks information, to have an impact. And I heard Vivian's voice in the background, librarianship, be a, become a librarian, go to library school. And so I had returned to Los Angeles during that time from Santa Cruz and um, knew that I wanted, didn't want to go far. And so I um, applied for UCLA's graduate school, got in and knew immediately that I wanted to be a public librarian. Like there was no doubt. And I knew from my ties of wanting to be an educator that I wanted to work with children. And so um, it was just a great thing. I was like, what, youth librarian, children's librarian? 
um, and did that. But, you know, Janae is a little bossy, a little nosy, you know, has great ideas and vision and, and decided to become branch manager and a regional manager and then head up engagement and outreach department and now serving in my current role. I've just been in the role six months now as director of emerging technologies and collections, overseeing acquisitions and cataloging our web technologies and staff training. Um, uh, that's sort of my journey, Julius. You know, it's interesting because you were the beneficiary of someone who came before you. And that goes back to what we just talked about, that we have to do the same thing. It's, it's our obligation. I wish I could say that, you know, it, and, and your journey certainly is it's, it's never like a, a nice, neat package in, no. in many places when people come to librarianship. It's certainly um, when you come to librarianship and you want to focus on serving a specific population, a specific community. I can tell you that um, I, I worked at the Congressional Research Service in high school and I hated it and thought I'd never come back. I came back in, in college and worked in the stacks. I hated it, and but I ended up ended up working there and uh, have been every every grade in the GS system from the lowest to the highest over, over these years. And it is certainly um, it, it has certainly been a journey. I will tell you that the biggest influence for me um, was Dr. John Henry Clark talking about this 1925 issue of Survey Graphic Magazine that Elaine Locke um, had edited. Uh, was the New Negro. And he talked about an article of uh, the Negro Digs Up His Past by Arthur Schomburg. And I ran to the library and, and, and got and read it. And I said, wow, I want to be a bibliophile like, like Arthur Schomburg. Arthur Schomburg was a, a, a great bibliophile, great historian. Um, you know, he's certainly um, uh, worked. He, he donated his collection to the New York Public Library System. He curated it. Um, but um, I, I saw a librarianship as a path to be like Schomburg. Um, and so that's kind of, that was kind of like my excuse. I can be a librarian because Schomburg was a librarian and now I want to be like Arthur Schomburg. And so that's kind of how I got into it. But, but we both, I think, um, are committed to um, serving uh, the African-American community. So why is it so important to serve the African-American community? And what are some of the issues and challenges? Yes, uh, African Americans have a unique history in this country, and it's very important that this population um, has the resources, has the folks that are going to be championing um, for them. Back in 1996, I was in library school and had the opportunity to serve as an intern for a project the California State Library sponsored. It was called Keeping the Promise recommendations for effective library service to African Americans. And um, it, it had a whole list of recommendations from variety of topics, from uh, collection development to programming, to funding, to advertisement and awareness. Um, and I just took a look back at that publication recently and all of the recommendations that the librarians throughout the state of California um, put in there are still relevant today, right? And it's mind blowing um, to say the least because that publication was directed towards librarians and library directors as a way to, um, to uh, get them to think about reaching out to African-American populations and their information needs and then restructuring their service plans and policies and procedures accordingly. And it makes me think that, have we gone backwards? Um, uh, we, of course, we've taken some steps forward, but to have a document that's a little over 25 years old to still be relevant today says that there is still work to be done. And it, you said it earlier, you know, the struggle continues. That's a really good point. I, I'm going I'm to talk about another document that we've had for over 200 years mm -hmm. um, that didn't include us in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the U.S. Constitution. Um, and certainly we have a number of amendments and you have to be you, you have to you almost be a legal scholar to understand how we fit in uh, to these amendments, certainly. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that um, I think about um, when serving the African-American community is that there, there's a lot of misinformation. 
And there's a lot of misinformation on voting right now. Like, can we vote? Will our rights be taken away? How does this whole thing work? And and I mean, I, what we do is we provide, we, we point people to what, what the answers are. I mean, you know, we, you don't have to take it, but we want to guide you to these answers. Um, we want to take you on that journey. We want you to be intellectual curi- intellectually curious, and we want to help you get there, right? Um, we want to we want to make this information accessible to all. I mean, we want to dispel the myths. Um, and there's so many myths, and there's such such a a a um, fragmented narrative of who we are. That's why I go back to uh, the Constitution um, because we need to understand that, that document. We need to understand what's real. Understand how this affects. Uh, us and our individual localities in the, in the, in our states. Understand the state laws. You know, understand what's at stake for us in the future. And I think that um, you know, the, the the librarian certainly serving the African American community is what we call the culture keeper. I mean, we have the keys to our past that are going to help move us forward uh, to our future. And I, I think that we need more people. That's why I wanted you to talk about how you got to this place, more people to follow in your footsteps so we can continue to open this door of who we are as a people and how we fit in to this experiment we call America. So, I mean, I think it's so important that we serve our community and we, we not just serve them, but serve them well. Um, and that means, that means we need those uh those African American librarians in school libraries. We need them in public library settings. We we certainly need them, and we're going to hear from Shannon today um, talking about health and doing research on Black health. We need them to do that. We need them in the academic setting, and, and we need them where I am at the National Library. Right? We need that perspective. We need that voice. Um, so I, I'm so glad that you made that choice, and I'm so glad that you are uh, an activist librarian. I want to pivot real quick. We don't have a lot more time, but I, I want to talk about the fact that you are the president of the California Library Association. Is that correct? Indeed, I am. <laughs> Why did you want to be president of the California Library Association? You know, at first I didn't. And uh, unfortunately, we lost Congressman John Lewis. Uh, in 2020. And I was listening to some clips and hearing him speak about, you know, if you see something, you need to do something, you see something, say something, um, get into good trouble, necessary trouble. And, and everything that was going on in our country at the time in the climate. And I was like, you know, you got to you it's now's the time for movement. Now's the time for action and had a colleague reach out to me that was on the nominating committee. I turned her down two or three times and, and his voice came up again. And I, you know, I believe in divine intervention. And I said, okay, this is a sign. Sure, throw my name in, in the hat. Let, let me run, let me see what type of impact that I can make um, in this position, heading up this institution that has been established since 1895, right? And so I have some ideas in, in terms of diversity and um, inclusion and social justice that I want the association to move in. Um, it's a one year stint. So, you know, I'm going to do the best that I can while I'm at the helm. Um, certainly we have a uh, our national our statewide conference coming up in June. And so looking to make an impact there. Um, and, and, and those are the reasons why. Yep. And and so we know you as past president of ALA. Tell us a little bit of why, what got you into that role. Yeah, I just fell into it. Right. And that's how mm-hmm. I just, I just fall into it. <laughs> but actually, I didn't. Um, it was it was very planned. Um, I, I, I took myself on an exercise to learn more about the profession, to learn more about the association. Mm-hmm. Um, I focused on. Uh, areas like intellectual freedom, which were really important to me at first. Uh, then uh, the policymaking body, which was council. Uh, then the executive board of the American Library Association. And then I ran for president. And I did that because what you just said, it's the impact. I, want, I wanted a voice and I wanted to have some impact. And um, when you are president, you get to set the agenda, right? Yep. Um, yep. You know, uh, every, every president gets to set the agenda. We have past president uh, Brown, Wanda Brown, who set the agenda when she was president. Unfortunately, Wanda and I, you know, kind of got the short end of the stick, so to speak, because we had to lead doing something that no one had to ever do. And that was this pandemic. 
Um, and and I, I give Wanda a lot of credit uh, because uh, Wanda was president right before me and she had to go virtual first. And I, it was it was not an easy thing to lead in the virtual setting and, and Wanda got through it and which helped me get through it. You know, that's why we stand on the shoulders of, of, of folks that come before us. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight was uh, service to the uh, to underrepresented groups. I wanted to focus on library services to uh, historically black colleges and universities, mm -hmm. to uh, the indigenous community, um, to Hispanic serving institutions, to rural institutions. These are institutions that don't necessarily, um, that we don't talk about uh, on a regular basis. We don't hear about these, 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 these communities. And I wanted to focus on that. Um, and I wanted to talk about advocacy in a broad way. We did something called Holding Space, um, a virtual advocacy tour. Um, because I, I thought it was it was it was important to highlight these communities and how can we get more funding and shine more light on these underrepresented communities and 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 that's what we were able to do. I was very fortunate um, to have a lot of great people around me to help uh, realize this and and you know it would end up being uh, you know taking taking the helm from Wanda in the virtual setting ended up being a complete virtual setting, um, which was not something that I had wanted. But it was the hand that was dealt, and so we we played the hand, and I think we made the most of it. But I think service, and I, I hope you agree, service, especially to your community within the profession, is paramount. I mean, Absolutely. you have to do it, and I would say you have to do it at the local level, like you at CLA, and I ha happen to have served as the um, District of Columbia Library Association president, um, and you have to do it at the national level. So it's not one or the other, it's both. You have to, you have to give this service and you have to be actively engaged um, on the local and national level, advocating for, for your community, advocating for outstanding library service uh, to, to, to individuals where, where you are and who may come after you, right? So I, I think it's, it's absolutely imperative that we do that. And I thank you for doing that and, and hearing the call. Well, listen to this. I must add that Wanda and you, Julius, also played in and factored into my decision to run because I saw the two of you, you know, who are reflections of me running. And I said, you know, because it's I'll be honest, there was a little trepidation there. Can I do this? And and absolutely I can do this. I, I had great examples. So thank you both. Absolutely. All right. We only have two more minutes. So we have time for one more question. I hope everyone has enjoyed our conversation. This is just uh, Janae and I having a conversation about who we are, um, you know, what, what we feel passionate about, certainly this profession, certainly serving the African-American community. So I'll just ask one last question, Janae. Okay. Um, what do you think your contribution is to Black history at this point in your life? Ooh, I love this question um, it, because it's such a huge, it's like a responsibility, right? And, and it, it, it calls me to action. And I think um, one of the things will be the work that I'm leaving behind at Los Angeles Public Library. You spoke earlier about, you know, more um, Black students becoming library students and joining our profession. And one thing that I'm proud of at LA Public Library is starting our diversity and inclusion apprenticeship program, um, bringing in high school and college students and during the summertime, giving them a full look and experience from library administration to collection development, to public service and programming. Um, this paid mentorship, um, I think is a good start to helping to diversify um, our, our, our profession. And so I'm really proud um, to, for us to be going in our eighth year of this paid uh, apprenticeship and um, really exposing students to the rewards of our wonderful profession. And so, and, and I also must say too, that I feel like the torch is being passed to me. You know, Miriam Matthews was the first African-American librarian in the state of California. And in 1927, she became um, the first black librarian at Los Angeles Public Library. 70 years later, I was hired by Los Angeles Public Library and she laid the foundation. She was absolutely a trailblazer. Um, and if I can do just half of the work that she has done, um, I will be proud of the legacy and the contribution to Black history. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think you said it best. Um, you know, we have an obligation uh, to, if we can do just half as much mm-hmm. as those who came before us, then we definitely would have done our job. I think for me, um, it is certainly trying to elevate um, Black librarianship, um, certainly elevating Black male librarians in the profession, mm-hmm. I think Black males in the profession. And I've talked about that for almost two decades now. Yes. And I think that's really, really important. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad to see Brian and, 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 and Forrest today uh two two gentlemen that are doing outstanding uh, jobs serving their community so i mean i think that's going to be i think our legacy together janae yes I mean, it is and on the shoulders of giants i don't know if we have time for questions but certainly it's been an honor to talk to you janae and it's honor. been the pleasure and honor has been all mine julius <clears throat> excuse me so we'll turn it over to dr chow well, fantastic. And if we were in an auditorium together, we'd be giving you a loud, a loud round of applause. So attendees, feel free to give, give them an applause, give them a, a, a shout out. But yeah, it's a great job, Julius. I really love the format and obviously storytelling and our history and our legacy and supporting those legacies are really critical. So beautiful, beautiful. Um, any questions before we turn it over to the forest? And again, uh, feel free to ask uh, additional questions in Q&A, and we can always address those later um, if, if needed. So, but again, thank you so much for your time. And also uh, for all of the attendees, uh, one sincerest form of leadership is this answering the call. So I want to thank, again, everyone uh, here giving us your time to, to, to bring this, uh, this, to have this discussion uh, for the benefit of the field. So thank you so much for that. Forrest, go ahead, sir. Thank you, thank you. And I mean, you know, we could just do away with my presentation. We can talk about history all day and I'm all for that. So that was a good lesson. I appreciate it. Uh, It's very engaging and I love to hear the story. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, But first I just want to say real quick, thank yous. I know I don't have too much time to uh, Dr. Chow, you and the SJS iSchool. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I know we all appreciate it. Hello to all the fellow panelists out there. I know we haven't had a chance to speak, some of us, but it's good to see the professional friends out there. Um, so my name is Forrest Foster, uh, Assistant Dean of Libraries at North Carolina a State University in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, East Coast. And uh, North Carolina a is the largest HBCU in the country, uh, 13,000 uh, students enrollment-wise. Um, recognized for its engineering program, nanoscience, nanoengineering, aside from the STEM disciplines, uh, business, and some, and some other uh, major disciplines as well. Uh, so let's just jump right into it, though. Um, you know, the question I think it was asked is, you know, how can libraries support communities of color? All right. So it, 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 am I able to share right now? Is that, am I able sure. to do that? Okay, let's do that. Yeah. And I had to get a couple slides. I'm sorry, I had to do it. So the question was asked, how, so how, you know, how do we do that? So I'm just gonna speak from my experience. Uh, in the past five years, I've been at a number of uh, institutions. Uh, and what you see before you is at Winston-Salem State, in my time at Winston-Salem State, which was around 2017. And we were fortunate enough to, uh, a librarian created a program and we all were able to uh, help out in that program. And that title is fourth grade goes to college. And some people ask, well, why is that important? Well, I'm going to throw a couple key buzzwords throughout the next seven minutes or eight minutes. And the buzzword here is exposure. You know, a lot of times uh, these kids from certain groups and certain communities or certain parts of the town, uh, depending on their schooling, they need exposure to new things, right? Whether it's technology, whether it's seeing another black male, female, adult, uh, to give them hope and inspiration and an aspiration. And uh, along, along, along those lines too, I think around, that was around the time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a, was a lot of media uh, spill about uh, school to prison pipeline, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I think that was one of our charges then too, was trying to not so much combat it, but you know, try to do something for the community on, from an academic library standpoint. And you'll hear me throughout the next few minutes talk about uh, some of the things I think academic libraries can do better, which is partner up, partnering up with uh, other academic libraries. You know, I know we do a great job with, you know, uh, collaboration on panelists, uh, collaboration with grants, 
but it's good to go hand in hand and do something impactful in the community. Uh, I think it sets a bigger uh, precedent as well. Uh, the next thing that we did while I was at uh, Winston-Salem State, CGO Kelly Library, is we partnered up with the library which I'm at now, FD Blueford Library. Uh, kind of coincidental and ironic, but um, around 2017, 2016, uh, there was a, a tornado that came through, Calamity, East Greensboro, and it just decimated uh, a couple of uh, elementary schools. So I reached out to uh, FD Blueford Library, which is at North Carolina a and and we just decided to do something, right? Uh, sometimes it just takes being intentional. Um, and so we decided to give back to the community. Uh, both Winston-Salem State and North Carolina a and are in African-American communities, uh, communities, which most HBCUs are. And so we just decided to give back, uh, whether it was clothes, whether it was resources, anything they needed, we supplied them. And you see the in the middle of the page, the thank you note from the principals and, and all the students. So they were very appreciative. And, and, and also too, it's, it's, it's fun. It, it feels rewarding, you know, uh, giving back and helping others grow as well. So the theme here is just hope. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we need hope to make it through certain uh, calamities and certain, certain uh, disasters. And hopefully that's what we provided for them. The next thing was another collaboration, uh, my time at Winston-Salem State. Uh, it's called the Human Library. We partnered up with Wake Forest University. Um, they actually kind of spearheaded it. They called us in to do this collaboration. And if, you, if those are not familiar with the Human Library project or initiative, it's kind of a, a metaphor for or an analogy to, you know, a, a human library or to a library, right? You go in, you, you know, you, you have certain speakers, you go check them out as you would check out a book, right? So you might have 20 speakers throughout this venue. They are speaking on different topics such as school to prison pipeline, redlining, uh, could be anything, entrepreneurship. So you check out those speakers and you just create a dialogue, right? You get to learn from practitioners, you get to learn from community uh, activists, you get to learn from people you know, who have something to say uh, to give inspiration. So you can empower individuals in your community to go do something, okay? So the key word here is empowerment. Um, something that we have done now at North Carolina a State University right now, this spring semester, we are on a, I wanna make sure I get this right, a four course red lighting project. We just had something in, in, in February um, and we're gonna do something in March and April. Uh, what you see before you right now is just the, the the, the finality of it, it will have Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, New York Times Magazine creator of the 1619 Project. She's gonna come speak. Uh, and this is something that we are spearheading, but we're also partnering, as you see below, with the Greensboro Bound, Greensboro Public Library, and uh, North Carolina Humanities. And you know, for those that are familiar with redlining, you know it's a major issue. We talked about this earlier. I think uh, Tim Janae mentioned it earlier. So how fitting that is, right? So. You know, we're looking at our communities uh, and we're just trying to figure out how we can help them, right? And, and dialogue and conversation and knowing where you came from. So we go back to that history uh, commonality there, right? Knowing where you came from and knowing how uh, redlining has affected us for the past five to six decades and probably before then, right? We talk about, you know, specifics in regards to uh, your neighborhoods and certain grocery stores, or if you don't have grocery stores, you know, now the term now is food desert, right? But even when you have certain grocery stores, you compare it to the other side of town, it doesn't have the same amenities. It doesn't have the same full uh, salad bar or the high end uh, seasoning or, or, or options that you have, organic this, or organic that. So there's major differences in these communities still to this day. Uh, and it's just not about grocery stores, it's about banks, schools, uh, transit systems, and then, you know, the, the, the lack of support is still going on in certain areas today. And lastly here, before I finish, is just something that uh, we did at North Carolina A&T this past fall, just a big city community engagement effort, uh, and library was part of that as well. I'm not going to talk uh, too much on it, but I just wanted to show that. And uh, I just want to wrap up by saying that being intentional is also important. Uh, you know, the question of how do we uh, support communities of color being intentional. Uh, and sometimes that can be difficult depending on leadership at your entity. 
uh, and depending on financial uh, assets, uh, more so the leadership. So it's very important to have leaders that have that understanding and that, that could push that through. So I leave you with empowerment, engagement, um, taking initiative will create value in your community and you will also create value in your community as well. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, and uh, given that we have a little more time, uh, Forrest, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow a page from Julius uh, and, and ask you, um, as we're awaiting questions, what does Black History Month mean to you? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I, you know, I, I get that good question. Wow, what it means to me is it's just a reflection on my family. Uh, you know, uh, thinking about my children, I have three children, uh, two of them which are boys, one of them uh, is a female. Uh, but I look at my grandparents as well and where I've come, where I came from. Um, you know, I, I'm blessed on one side, uh, on my father's side, excuse me, my mother's side, I'm a third generational, um, you know, college graduate. And that's, you know, I think that's very rare in, in some cases. So I, I definitely hold that dear and I take advantage of that. And, you know, I teach my children that education is important. Um, now, my mother's side and my, excuse me, my father's side is totally different. Right. Uh, you know, sharecropping, farming in Alabama, uh, you know, so I, I see both ends of the spectrum and I want to take both of those narratives and teach them to my children. But also here in librarianship, uh, the students that I see every day, I, you know, we come across maybe not 13,000, all of our students, but we come across probably a thousand to two thousand to three thousand. And we can make an lasting impression on all of them, uh, whether it's by you know, customer service at the desk, whether it's by making them feel welcoming, whether it's by, you know, some, you know, library, you know, instructional class, or just speaking uh, in certain aspects uh, on campus. So um, it means a lot in different dynamics, but as um, long as I'm here, I will pass the baton on to who's next in, in regards to librarianship. And um, yeah, that's what I'll do. Wonderful, Forrest. And uh, you mind if I ask you one more question? Sure. Uh, so what are your thoughts around uh, increasing um, uh, Black and African-American librarians and in particular uh, Black male librarians? So, great question. Thoughts? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, I, I have a lot of friends, uh, African-American friends in the profession. And, you know, we sit and talk. Um, and I mean, ideally, what I would like to do is just go out uh, to certain schools, uh, whether it's high school, whether it's uh, middle school, and just start to have conversations at first. Because I think they need to see, as someone mentioned, you know, there's different dynamics of everyone, right? There's, there's not just this A or B category. Uh, all, all of us bring something to the table, and I think that we can connect in that way. And, and what's interesting is that all of us are dynamic in our own way. You know, we all wear many different hats. From eight to five, yes, we're a librarian. But after eight to five, we're, we're A, B, C, D, elemental P. And I think we need to bring that to the table to showcase and connect with students. And, you know, libraries changing. Uh, so, I, you know, the, the stereotypical image of a library is definitely changing. So I think uh, there's some ground to be made there too. So, but hey, I, I, could, I could be on that topic all day, but. Great, well, we may have to follow up with you on that for us. Thank you definitely. so much. Thank um, you. I, I do see a question. Let me see if that is, uh, okay, that's just a resource. So, all right, well, thank you again, Forrest. Um, now let's uh, turn it over to uh, Brian, who is the, uh, the head of the uh, Forsyth County uh, Public Libraries, Library System, excellent uh, library system and uh, held in a very high regard. So, Brian, go ahead. Uh, so, so good afternoon uh, <clears throat> for those on this side of the country. Uh, Good morning to those of you on uh, the other side of the country. I don't want to be divisive, uh, and say east or west, <laughs> but but good morning and good afternoon to you all. Um, I, I'm I'm excited, uh, honored to be a part of this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Chow uh, uh, and uh, and Wanda Brown. Thank you uh, for the invite and for uh, coordinating and pulling uh, all of these uh, talented individuals and resources uh, together for this. For this call. Um, I did not necessarily prepare a specific presentation. And so um, I would just ask that the attendees and my fellow panelists bear with me. And I'll just kind of walk through some of the ways in which the Forsyth County Public Library uh, here in Winston, headquartered in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, continues 
to support uh, African American communities uh, and, and library service uh, provision uh, to all county residents. Um, and I do emphasize that to all uh, county residents because I think that uh, African American history or Black history is American history. And so um, it is important uh, that we emphasize that and that we uh, share um, our accolades, our accomplishments, and our history uh, with the larger community, uh, regardless of what ethnicity uh, you know, or, or race uh, they may be. And so one of the ways in which the Forsyth County Public Library has done so this year um, is that we have you know, really increased uh, the, the degree of partnerships uh, that we uh, have, have entered into in an, in an effort to, not unlike we've done in this call, pool all of the resources and talent together so that we can you know, broaden our reach and be more effective in our service uh, to, to county residents, particularly those of you know, African-American um, ethnicity and, and, and the marginalized groups uh, that may exist throughout the county. And so one of those partnerships has been with the, uh, with the Winston-Salem Foundation. And through our partnership with them, we've been able to bring uh, an exhibit titled Undesigned the Red Line, uh, which I will share uh, with you all. Um, and as I kind of talk through it, uh, you are welcome to click on the link that I pasted in the chat. Uh, so Undesigned the Red Line is an exhibit um, that was uh, curated uh, by uh, an organization uh, of, of artists um, and, and historians uh, who have put together um, you know, the, the, the history, the origins of redlining, um, the effects of redlining. Uh, they put together various maps to showcase or highlight where uh, redlining occurred uh, within the Winston-Salem uh, community and throughout, uh, really throughout communities across America. Um, and this exhibit is in an interactive exhibit uh, that allows uh, people who are visiting or touring the exhibit uh, to come in and make you know, observations and leave comments about how you know, redlining and similar, um, you know, um, uh, similar divisive um, you know, activities have impacted their communities and their families. Uh, the exhibit has been on a showcase here at the Central Library uh, since November. Uh, and it was so, so well received by the community at large that we extended uh, it from, I was supposed to, I think, expire in, or not expire, but be moved away um, in early January, but we extended it throughout the end of this month to give uh, broader audiences and more people an opportunity to come and experience it and, and educate or inform themselves about the effects of redlining. Um, additionally, uh, one other thing that I'm quite proud of that we've done from an outreach perspective, or excuse me, a partnership perspective, is that we've been working uh, with the uh, Forsyth County Department of Public Health uh, to not only distribute to not only distribute uh, uh, COVID test kits um, and, and provide other services uh, that help to alleviate the strain that COVID has had on the community, uh, but we've also highlight or worked with them to highlight their professionals, their staff, and the ways in which they work to um, equip uh, you know, African-American communities uh, with the necessary tools and resources they need to uh, improve their health and their overall well-being. Uh, the theme for uh, Black History Month this uh, year focuses on health and wellness. And so it was particularly important for us to align ourselves with the public health department to advance some of those initiatives. Um, and again, you know, broaden um, uh, our, our impact and, and the ability that we had to positively uh, influence, uh, you know, lives in, in the county. Uh, one other initiative that I'll share, I'm, I know I'm dumping a lot of links on you all here today, so I apologize, uh, but hopefully you can share those and view them at your leisure. Uh, but another initiative that we uh, launched uh, this month here in Forsyth County uh, are Forsyth County Public Library Literacy Stations, which are essentially uh, deposit collections of materials uh, that are set up in businesses throughout the community. Um, and as you can imagine, they're most likely or most often um, in communities uh, that are impacted, um, where marginalized people are, are, you know, receiving services um, and handling the different, you know, things that they need to handle in the course of their lives and the course of their days. And so we thought that this was a really good initiative and a really good way to make library materials and resources more accessible to them. Uh, some of these communities are very walkable. Um, and so we know that people can, you know, visit these uh, locations, uh, such as the barbershops or the uh, laundromats uh, where, where these literacy stations occur, 
whereas it might not be as easy for them to visit, um, you know, the one of our 10 locations. Um, and so we've tried to make literacy uh, and, and, and literature more accessible uh, to, the, to the community through efforts such as this. And then the last thing that I will share uh, before passing the baton to one of the other panelists um, is I wanna share uh, that the Forsyth County Public Library is a member of uh, a member library of the Urban Library Council. And the Urban Library Council very recently, um, well, recently is relative. Uh, the pandemic has kind of blurred my sense of time. So <laughs> apologies there. Uh, but the Urban Library Council has uh, developed a statement on race and social equity. Um, and they've also uh, developed toolkits and other, um, other resources to help public libraries uh, in urban centers uh, you know, develop strategies for how to better serve and, and connect with um, audiences of color, um, communities of color, and, and how we can better advocate for them through our, our service models. And so the Forsyth County Public Library is one of 200 uh, or so libraries who have signed on uh, to this uh, statement on race uh, and social equity. Um, and after signing on that, just so you know that it wasn't just empty words or just us, you know, putting pen to pad and then being done with it. Uh, as a result of that, we also worked internally to develop an initiative uh, titled Read to Right Wrongs, uh, where we have uh, forums, uh, not unlike this uh, forum here, uh, where we put, put, put together um, or touch base with uh, experts um, and other grassroots organizations in the community to uh, have meaningful dialogue and discussions um, about different topics that impact uh, marginalized or, or uh you know, communities or other disadvantaged communities or people. And uh, those uh, discussions are streamed on our Facebook. Uh, we try to offer them at times that are very convenient. Uh, so we usually do them in the evenings around 7 or 8 p.m. Um, when, when we, you know, assume that people are kind of at home, they've uh, had their dinner, and, and now they're just kind of casually browsing uh, through the web, as, as we all do sometimes. And we're hoping that we'll catch or pique their curiosity and interest uh, and that they will then be able to, um, you know, engage with us on these different topics that we're discussing uh, through the Read to Write Wrongs uh, panel discussions um, and, and, you know, and equip them with resources and tools to help them, uh, you know, make an impact in, in their own lives and in the lives of those uh, in the communities and neighborhoods in which they live. So um, that's a, a broad overview uh, uh, with links uh, for you to do your own exploration about the ways in which the Forsyth County Public Library is serving the community. Uh, and I will remain on the call uh, for its duration should anyone have any questions or, or suggestions uh, for how the library system here in Forsyth County can continue to do its work uh, in service to the community. Thank you, Brian, very much. Um, I think we do have one question uh, and I think it would be for you and really the entire panel um, from Pauline Murph. Uh, she says, I serve in a community in Southern Oregon. There are not a lot of African-Americans in the population, but I believe it is important to provide materials and information for the whole community, and especially its African-Americans. Because of the severe lack of Black community members and their input, how can I best serve this community? So I will say that um, it is important to um, be very plugged in to your communities and to understand the needs and interests of the community. Um, and I think that as you are developing services and programs, you can find out not only where the interests are, but also where the deficiencies are. And you can fill in the gap, you can stand in the gap, you can create services and programs that respond directly to those deficiencies. You can, uh, in, in, in a way to kind of find out what they are, or you can do surveys, you can have uh, listening tours, where you go across the community and engage, um, you know, what the community would like to learn about and then you find ways uh, through your programs, through your services, through your collections to respond to what those, um, you know, interests are or what those gaps are. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there with my response because I see a, another panelist has raised their hand and would perhaps want to chime in. Yolan, go ahead. 
Sure. I'm happy to talk about this because I know that um, I served as county librarian in Nevada County and an area that is not extremely diverse and a a relatively small African-American population. But I was still able to um, really work with the community to highlight and feature the history There is a long history. Uh, Jeannie Carter, who was an African-American woman who uh, wrote for newspapers in San Francisco. Um, And I think it was the the elevator. She would write short stories. She directly came out of Nevada County, right? And so by researching and understanding the history of your area, we have to recognize that African-Americans have been here (laughs) for so long and we have contributed in so many different ways to every community in this country. And I guarantee you, if you really do your research on the history of that area, you'll find that there are ties to the African-American community. And you can start there with sort of bringing that information forward and ensuring that everybody in the community knows the contributions that African-Americans provided, and then reach out to those groups and other organizations in your community to work on other initiatives just like we've talked about, some of the panelists have talked about here. Great point. Um, And I'll also throw out too, that I believe um, it's important to give uh, very specific examples of what racism looks like. Um, And what I mean by that is if you've ever been on the receiving end, uh, it is a very painful event when, when you're being attacked by something that you are. Right. And so I think it's very important uh, for those that have not experienced that ever to understand what it's like, to understand that it's a very real um, issue that, especially when we're talking about our children, is something we all want to prevent uh, in in the future. Right. And so I I, I would also say that as well. So it's not just an academic exercise that you do truly understand, um, you know, the painfulness of, of of that type of of action. So, and then hopefully uh, this, this uh, YouTube video that we're going to have in the full transcript from uh, today's session will also be um, something and certainly also to have community conversations. So, um, all right. Any other uh, thoughts from the panel? So thank you, Brian. It's good to, good to see you. Um, now uh, turn it over to Wanda. I, I want to thank Wanda for all that she has meant to me um, as a young professor when I first came to North Carolina. Yes, she's a role model for me uh, because, you know, we cause a lot of trouble as advocates for libraries, both at the state and national level. And she's a role model because of all that she represents and all that she's accomplished uh, in her own career. Uh, and so, um, and she's working while, uh, while doing a sympo- national symposium, too. So it's just a classic example of, of Wanda Brown. Uh, Wanda, um, am I uh, delighted to turn it over to you, ma'am? Thank you very much. I was just, I left my door open. And of course, <laughs> I had students to walk in. But I wanted uh, to start with a message, I think, to the students who are listening today, is that what we feel from today's presentation is the pride that we have in our our own race, our own ethnicities, but also what it does when you highlight those accomplishments with your students, with your community, with the people you serve, then you, you elevate them and you make them feel welcome. You make them feel like they're a part and that they belong. And so I would encourage you as you go through library school and you look for your positions that you take this in and you realize that it is the passion from which Julius and Jean started all the way down to Forrest, Brian. Everybody is speaking with passion. And if you have that passion, that transcends across colors, across communities, across economic situations, then you will bring to the profession what the profession needs, which is what you have seen witnessed in our conversations today. So I'll get off my soapbox and get on my topic. I am here before you today as Director of Library Services at Winston-Salem State University located in Winston-Salem. We are, I say, rather small, publicly funded um, uh, school within the UNC system, minority serving primarily. We have about 80 
78 uh, percent of our student body identifies as African American. Another seven percent identify as white. 4.5 identify as Hispanic. And we were founded in 1892 with the mission to educate. And so therefore, um, when we were talking earlier, uh, I think it was Dr. Chow who was talking about the incidences in, in 2020 and all the double pandemic is what I'm calling it, the pandemic, but then we had racial unrest too, all at the same time. And so while the schools were writing their statements about support and appreciation and valuing differences, et cetera, that was when I really felt really good about the work we do here at Winston-Salem State. And it reminded me that we, had a program here where we embed social justice within the freshman experience. So a lot of what you've heard people talk about today about redlining, about um, health disparities, about food deserts, those things, we uh, kind of embed that into the freshman experience. So freshmen are divided into cohorts and that cohort might be a floor in a dorm, but then they come together and they have this class. It's a two credit hour class. So they have that class. In that class, they are introduced to those five tenants that I thought I would share those tenants with you. Uh, health disparity, we've been talking about that already. Educational disparities, economic empowerment, diversity, and then community sustainability. So if you think about those things, we are educating the whole student, right? So student needs to value, needs to appreciate, needs to understand why his life is the way it is, right? And so we feel like immersing them into this program gives them a opportunity to meet other people, to share similar stories, to interact, but they also come together around a project. And this project is to increase the understanding of health disparities within them. So, so we've had some really, really great um, products to come from this, but I would say the most important thing has been that it introduces them to things on a level that maybe they never thought about. I think it was Forrest who mentioned about how Grocery stores on one part of town may not have the organic food. You know, it's like in Winston-Salem, we like to call it the 52 divide. And if you live on, it, literally, if you live on this side of 52, your food line is going to close at 10. If you live on that side of 52, your food line will probably stay open until 11. You know, just little things like that, that we want to educate our students around so that they, they do have a a solid understanding. And so they understand that education is the key and how that education that they're pursuing here with all those factors. In 2020, the fall of 2020, those uh, educational disparities were <laughs> evidenced because you had students all at home. Remember, we went virtual in, in the fall of 2020. And so there were students who didn't have access to the internet or didn't have access. I had a, a staff member whose uh, students, maybe the first fall semester, were never able to find a steady connection to the internet. So can you imagine how that impacted that student's ability to stay on top of education that fall. And so it was a good time to be talking about that during the fall of 2020. But I also say that this class also gives librarians a chance to A, we can either teach it. And then uh, once a semester, we kind of go in full blast and do a blitz where we talk to them around how to cite their sources, how to do research effectively. And we have a LibGuide that is created that really more or less is a landing page for all the freshmen in that course that kind of gives them essentials. But I say all that to say that this class, this whole um, undertaking is to educate, is to elevate, right? Because the more we know, the more we understand. But it also says that we are interested in that whole student and your ability to be as successful as you can be. And so we as, as um, 
as an institution that have, we have a lot of students who are first generation. So you've kind of talked about that today. I'm the product of that. I usually tell my story about why I'm not one of the um, sororities <laughs> is that when I went, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. So I, know, I knew nothing about AAs, Deltas, or anything like that. And I came to one same state and I saw these people making these people do all these crazy things, taking up one fort, taking up one night. I thought, I'm never going to do that too. So, but see, now I have a greater appreciation for it, right? So sometimes we have to remember that everybody hasn't walked ever down the same road. Our path to where we are today comes so differently to for many of us. And so there's another thing that has been shared amongst every speaker, and that word is empathy, right? You have to understand that maybe the life that you have lived is different, but what my job is, is to help you be as successful as possible. So I'm going to conclude. I think I covered just about everything I want to say about the program. And besides, I'm down to like 30 seconds or so. Uh, and I'm happy to entertain any uh, questions you might have. And, and Wanda, thank you for that. Um, and actually, we have a, lot, a little more time. So um, <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do is, again, just uh, follow uh, suit with what Julius has done and just ask you a few questions. So I think really that first one would be, what, what does Black History Month uh, mean to you? I, I think I've shared a little bit about it in my speech. Now, I, I think for me, it's a time to reflect around my own heritage and how proud I am of the work that we do, the work that our profession does. But I would say that we have to make sure that we are sharing our history more than just in the month of February. But I also think it's very important that we share it now because I, I know we've been doing a little trivia thing here at work uh, with the students and you'd be surprised what the students know and what they don't know. And I do think that it becomes a part of our responsibility to share that history, to share the knowledge that we have. Because when you think about the pipeline to prison that a lot of African-American young men are on or Hispanic men are on, somehow or another, I feel like they didn't know all the opportunities that were there for them, right? Or there was nothing that really made them feel like I have a choice, I have an option, right? And so somehow or another, Black History Month to me has to be the has to be the beginning of the year <laughs> where we instill into young people the value that they bring to the table, their differences and everything, how much we appreciate that, but how that difference is not a negative thing. That difference is a positive and a value and it makes life more enjoyable when we have diversity around us. So Black History Month is just a time to kickstart us off for the rest of the year. Thank you, Wanda. Um, mm -hmm. And then let me also follow that up with a question of really, or yeah, request, which is, could you just share a little bit about your history? Uh, again, um, I know you were, you were a guest speaker in a number of my classes in the past, but could you just share a little bit about kind of your history and then how you kind of got to where you are. Now, is this my door into librarianship? Is that mm -hmm. the one you want? I have mm -hmm. lots of stories. Mm -hmm. so I want to well, whatever you want to share. <laughs> <laughs> my story is, uh, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to blend two stories together here just for a second or two, because when we've been talking today about the value of education, I will share with you, and I've shared this before, is that when I'm adopted at the age of nine, my adopted father could not read, right? But he valued education so much that he would sit beside me at the table. We would do our homework at the table, and he would ask me words, and he taught himself to read from that. So we know that education is the key. So he was so sad I was going to school, but I was so sad I didn't want to stay in, in North, that end of North Carolina. So I came to Winston-Salem State to attend school. And uh, like, I think it was Jean, this was my source of employment. I worked here my freshman, sophomore, and junior years in college. And I um, was certified to teach secondary English. Um, but 
I did not have the greatest of all student teaching experiences. You know, you had this one thing in your mind that you always wanted to be a teacher, always wanted to be a teacher. It really was different. It was the beginning of um, what they called teen teaching. And it was in uh, a rural town and it was just different than what I thought teaching was gonna be. So, but I didn't wanna go back home. I knew I had to find a job. <laughs> so um, you go, you're looking for a job. They wanna know what you've done. Well, I spent three years working in the library at Winston Salem State. And so I was told that Wake Forest University had a position that was open. However, it required a master's. But however, it was, this was like maybe June 1st, if the position wasn't filled by June 15th, they would lose this grant funding from the city of Winston-Salem. So I applied for the job, got it, reminded them they only had so many days to fill it. And uh, that started the beginning of my career. That was back in the early, early mid 70s. I worked maybe two years and I decided, you know what, I like this. So I enrolled in the program at UNC, uh, UNCG Greensboro, got my degree, stayed at Wake Forest a few decades, maybe three, <laughs> and did a multitude of things. At one point, I was probably over half of the library because I did cataloging, I did technical services, access services, then eventually I became assistant dean. So I tell people, you know, I've done it all. I, I literally dropped cards in the card catalog when I first started. But it gives me a great appreciation for all the work that is done. Uh, I tell people I'm weakest in reference. So please don't ask me to sit the reference. That's what I'm weakest in reference. But uh, I do think my greatest strength is people. I enjoy people. I want to see people be as successful as possible. Hence, pulling this program together was an absolute joy. I thank you, Dr. Chow, for that. Uh, because I like to see people give back. And that's a message I want the students who are listening today to take back. Well, thank, thank you, Wanda. Again, thank you for your support of this program and the field and all that you've done. And and again, uh, too humble because because uh, the... Uh, the library at Wake Forest was, was, was renowned for being innovative and, and just really very user centered and very, very student friendly. And, and so, yeah, thank you for, for all that you do. Um, well, we do have one question uh, uh, stepping back to Brian um, and uh, let's see, where's that question? So um, the, the question, uh, well, here, I'm going to paste this too. So the questions, the programs that you shared were wonderful. Thank you for the ideas. And I'm going to post uh, the list here. And the question really is, um, given, Brian, that list that you gave us, um, is there anything that you left off that you, let's see. So now my question, is there any other approach that is missing from this list that will help me understand the variety of fronts in which to engage marginalized communities? And again, this could be open up to the entire panel, but, but directed at Brian. Yeah, so I definitely uh, would love to hear what the other, other panelists have to say. I think it's important for us to not limit ourselves um, in terms of how we uh, engage and interact with, uh, you know, co communities of color, African-Americans, uh, you know, Asians, Hispanic, Latinas, uh, Latinx community. I, I, it's important for us to, you know, um, explore the possibilities and to work in, in tandem with members of those communities so that we can curate services that we know will be resonant with them. Um, I will share um, only because my uh, outreach, um, our outreach manager would probably be uh, disappointed if I did not speak to this, um, but because we recognize that, um, you know, there's a virtual component to outreach, right, particularly in this era where we you know, become more and more comfortable with Zoom, and we know that it allows us to extend or expand our reach further into the community. Uh, for Black History Month, our outreach team has been uh, developing uh, these literacy breaks, um, and I've yet again placed the link in the chat there. Um, uh, and, and thank you um, to, to Alf Alfredo, who was helping with the links earlier. But essentially what this literary break, literacy break is, is uh, just a series of reading recommendations um, that we that our outreach team has been kind of developing and pushing out to the community to, you know, expose them to uh, African-American uh, literature over the course of uh, the month. Um, 
but but again, I just I think there's uh, you know uh, endless possibilities, uh, particularly if we're working with those communities who we're serving to to develop those programs, um, you know, in partnership with them. Thank you, Brian and Wanda. Go ahead. Brian, but you also do outreach to the homeless as well, right? Uh, uh, you have a former homeless person who oversees your homeless efforts. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a part of, uh, if you're looking for a front, that's an area for public library to consider as well. Yeah, and, and, and so uh, that person that, that Wanda's uh, referencing is, um, he's, uh, that is again a partnership that we have uh, with the Department of Social Services. Um, and he is a peer support specialist. Uh, he himself has experienced uh, various forms of homelessness and, and works uh, with uh, members of the community who are still uh, you know, battling those different bouts um, to, to put them in touch with resources and different agencies um, that can aid them you know, in their path to becoming more stable um, or, or bouncing back from whatever setback they may have experienced that led them to that point. Um, I, yeah, no, and, I, and we're really proud of our efforts there. Uh, we did receive an LSTA grant from the uh, State Library to help get that program up and running. Um, I will say one of the reasons why I didn't um, highlight that initially because, uh, and this will come as no surprise to anyone, uh, but, you know, there, there are people of all race, races, ethnic, ethnicities, and, and, you know, backgrounds who experience homelessness, and that's not something you know, that's just specific to our community. In fact, the majority of the uh, homeless population that we serve, you know, I think are really, um, I'll just say it's a, it's a, it's across the spectrum. There's a vastness to it. Um, they come from different walks of life, at different ages, there's different um, ethnicities represented. And, uh, but, but that is agreed, uh, definitely something that we're, we're proud of and that we uh, want to continue to be able to do um, in service to the community. Um, but yes, thank you, Juan, for mentioning that. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Wanda. Uh, okay, so our next uh, speaker is Shannon Jones, the Director of Libraries uh, at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, Shannon, go ahead. Shannon, I'm sorry, you're on, you're on mute. No problem. <laughs> Only two years of this, right? Um, so first of all, thank you so much for uh, for the opportunity to come and participate in the program today. And as as I'm sitting here and, and listening, you know, what what can I contribute to the conversation? Um, and it and so I'm, I'm a uh, co-sign with what everyone else has said. So. I have worked in uh, health sciences libraries my entire career, which is now almost about 20 years. Um, the first half I spent as an, an outreach librarian on, at Virginia Commonwealth University. And um, I don't know if you all know much about health sciences libraries or just the information seeking behaviors in health sciences libraries. Um, as we have put more content online, fewer people come to the library. And so outreach has to be a core of, of what we do. And so I spent the first half of my career developing a, a high touch, high engagement um, outreach, outreach philosophy that pushed and encouraged the, uh, the team that I was supervising to get out of the library so that they could go be a part of the community and learn the community that they, they were serving, but also learn the gaps and maybe who we were not touching as well. And so we, um, in, in, in that work, um, did a lot of work very similar to what Forrest presented in terms of offering a variety of types of programs to connect with our affiliated users, because again, they were not coming to the library. So it was the students, faculty and staff, but then we also had a patient library in our hospital. And so that, that was a different type of engagement. So we, we've, um, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to do things like working at health fairs to be able to take information out to, uh, to communities of color. Um, but I'd say that the thing that I, I like to share with you, that the, the most important thing was just the idea of being intentional. And I believe Brian talked about that. Also, the idea of partnerships, because one thing that in health sciences, as you're thinking about trying to um, increase information access, to share information with people, to make people aware of resources and to amplify um, 
free and for fee uh, library services and resources that 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 requires someone more than just the library. So partnerships are of all importance. And so um, one of the hats I wear at the Medical University of South Carolina, where I am right now, is that I'm also the director of uh, Region 2 of the network of the National Library of Medicine. And what the uh, NNLM recognizes is that libraries can't do um, health disparities work in a vacuum. We can't do any work to help, you know, increase information access in a vacuum. So we have to partner with community organizations to uh, carry the message, messages forward. And so I say that probably one of the projects that I uh, appreciated and felt like I had the greatest impact was as a uh, outreach librarian, I served on a um, as part of a research team and as a focus group leader for a researcher who was studying how uh, African Americans, Asians, uh, Latinos, and white people got their health information. And he, before he decided that he was going to have a facilitator, facilitators of color or that match the audiences, he was not having any luck. And so I came in for African Americans and we had the best facilitators and we got uh, the best information out because I looked like the audience and I resonated with them. And so they were, they saw me as one of them. And so that really helped. And so one thing is to be visible. Another thing is to remember that we need to amplify the voices and the perspectives of communities of color. And so, you know, in a leadership role, what I think about often is who have I seen constantly getting the opportunity to pour into audiences? And so now I want to bring um, people of color and make sure I, you know, create a platform for them. So I want to pivot away from my library a little bit and just talk about some of the work that I have done with the African American Medical Librarians Alliance in which we are part of the Medical Library Association because we're so underrepresented in that group and we often need to be able to take care of us and to hold space for us. And one of the things that our group has um, been able to do is to really change the narrative of the black librarian in health sciences. And so we, um, you know, we've been on the sidelines for a number of, um, for a number of years, um, unable to get on committees, unable to, um, to serve in leadership roles because we were just not pulled or sponsored from those groups. And we've carved out a pathway for ourselves. And so I'd say that we're probably the most impactful caucus uh, in the Medical Library Association. But what we've done is created uh, a platform to bring diverse voices to that community. And so, you know, we um, have conversations that had not been happening. So we just finished a book um, discussion on uh, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. And not so much for, for us, the Black members, but for everybody else, because they need to learn this stuff too. And so we have um, been able to uh, put, um, amplify the message of, you know, information access or the what you know the struggles that the black librarian have gone through and or we've just been in a position where we've been able to support each other because that is just as important as um, you know as many of my colleagues work in environments where they are the only person the only uh, black librarian and we've created a space called our chat and chew and we meet every Friday at noon and we talk about things or we let people vent or, you know, right now we are into financial freedom. And so that's, you know, we bring speakers to talk to us about topics that are important to us, but sometimes we've been shut out of. And so I think when we think about communities of color, we also have to think about our colleagues of color too. And so, you know, we've heard everybody up here today talk about what they do for and how they're serving the uh, students that are our target populations. And so I just wanted to share in terms of how we, um, some of the work that I've done to try to help 
hold space for black librarians within the medical library association so that we can make sure that we are we have a community for us to uh, to be able to bounce ideas off of to strengthen our own professional practice to um so that you know when we have ideas about you know hey we we want to uh, serve on X number of committees, what kind of strategy can we have to make sure that we are lifting? For me, I'm the president-elect of MLA. And, you know, for me, I'm always thinking about how can I lift as I climb? How can I bring people with me? Because I can't be the only one representing uh, for Black librarians, but I want that opportunity and to bring other people with us. And so how can we do that for our Latinx colleagues? And so we're always thinking about how can we partner and how can, who else can we bring to the table when um, we get to positions where we are able to see the table more clear and we can see who's missing. And so, um, so for me, it's been about being intentional, building partnerships, being an advocate and using my voice and my platform to make sure that I'm not leaving people behind. And so, um, so I wanted to share that. I'll put the link to our website so that you can see some of um, the programs that we have been able to do. And um, we are very proud of those programs just because there, there was a period where our community didn't think Black librarians knew anything or could contribute anything or had expertise in anything. And I think we have been able to create that platform. So, you know, you don't have to ask us to come and speak. We're gonna create our own programs and now you wanna come and hear us. And so that that's what we're most proud of that we are establishing that legacy and um, really, um, you know, putting our stake in the history of Black librarians and health sciences because that history has not been written yet. We are writing it. And so we are um, now, you know, securing um, our space in history so that people 20 years from now can look back and know that we were here and that we made, you know, really valuable contributions to um, health sciences. And so I just want to share, uh, share that with you all. Thank you very much, Shannon. And it's good to meet you, by the way. Thank you. Um, so we actually have a question for, I guess, really the entire panel uh, from Annabelle Fair. Um, so for any panelists, given that the prison industrial complex disproportionately targets and impacts black and brown folks, what can librarians, information professionals be doing to support people during incarceration and after? And is anyone here currently engaged in this type of work? This is open to anyone that might have a thought um, regarding this. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about it. Personally, and, and I guess in the profession, we're not at, at my institution, we're not doing anything. That's, and that's something I'll touch on that later, but I know there are some individuals in the library uh, profession that do go out to those spaces and uh, do some type of tutelage, do some type of tutoring. Uh, I haven't seen it uh, lately. Uh, I haven't read up on it lately as far as the literature, how that's going, the successes of that. But I did know in the past that there, there was some type of measure of librarians going out uh, into those spaces. Uh, you know, something beyond the norm than just, you know, uh, you know, holding conversations in the library or holding conversations in the public, but they were actually going out to those, to the prisons and the jail cells to do something. Um, so, yeah. There used to be a, a handful of prison librarians uh, that we used to interact with at ALA, but I, I haven't um, seen any in a while. And I, I do know that in, in my role here, we don't do any work for uh, the prisons directly, but I get lots of letters from prisoners asking for health information. And um, we don't, I typically will pass it over to our general counsel's office because we, they typically are looking for information to support a case. And that's beyond the scope of what we contribute into because there's some liabil legal liability with, with that. But, you know, it does remind me that they don't necessarily have librarians in their environments. And so, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it's, um, they are a population, again, that gets left behind, but they are a population that tends to do their own research sometimes. And so, um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of um, 
of anything. I, I used to know a young lady that used to come to ALA that used to do it, and she loved working in um, the prison libraries, but that's probably been about 15 years now. All right. Thank um, you, Shannon. I see Brian and uh, Julius. Go ahead. Okay. So, so we are, we as the county public library system, we're, we're a county department and, you know, the sheriff's office uh, exists and functions as the county uh, department and county service as well. And so we do have a relationship with them um, in the midst of COVID, we cease kind of our, um, you know, uh, direct service um, to, to the population. Um, and, but that's been so that we're in alignment with, you know, what the sheriff's office and the detention center's protocols are. Um, historically, we have visited um, and provided, you know, some level of, of, of service to um, the detention centers, particularly the juvenile detention centers. Um, we would go into the common areas, our outreach staff, I say we, um, but, but our outreach staff in particular would go into the common areas and provide, you know, some materials and literature. Um, uh, but, but that was kind of the extent of it um, because as, as uh, you know, Shannon mentioned, uh, there are obviously limitations because some of those needs that they may have um, would exceed some of our expertise. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, Julius? So, I mean, yeah, as Shannon mentioned, ALA continues this work of um, focusing on uh, prisoners and the prisoner's right to read. Um, just recently, um, ALA signed on with the Penn Foundi Foundation to provide tablets uh, to prisoners, uh, as well as um, uh, I Love My Librarian Award. There were 10 winners. One of them was a prison librarian from, from Maryland. Uh, in addition, um, I think that the work that ALA does around prisoners and their right to read will continue um, as the uh, interpretation uh, will be updated. And um, there are still significant advocates for those uh, who are in prison. I mean, you heard me earlier talk about the constitution. Well, we know when people are incarcerated, they lose their constitutional rights. Uh, one, of, one of which is to vote actually. Um, certainly, um, I think that the American Library Association and its members uh, support uh, this effort to provide access to information to prisoners. And I think that's gonna continue. Thank you, Julius. ALA yeah, is also actually rewriting the library standards for adult correctional institutions. I'm a part of that working group. And so that's what we're doing is rewriting, you know, in a way that we can advocate for, for prisoners and for people in that. We just got started on that work, though. But oh, so it is fresh. I mean, it's still a fresh thing. Yeah, thank you, Wanda. Um, Julius, were, were you going to comment? Yeah, and I do want to say, in my uh, since being in California, I've, I've learned that there is not a very strong relationship between prison libraries and any other type of libraries uh, within the county. In other words, they tend to be overseen by the warden. Uh, and so the consistency of services that the prisoners are receiving uh, is, is questionable in terms of the, uh, you know, following a set of standards and also uh, working with other professional librarians in, in their local area. So, uh, but with that being said, um, uh, let's uh, turn it to- Dr. Yes, I, I would like to add that we here at Santa Cruz Public Libraries do have a relationship with our local county jail. Um, we do check out collection materials. Um, we uh, do open uh, library cards for inmates, and it is a relationship that the library has built with the county jail system uh, over the years. During COVID, um, I think Brian mentioned this, we have not been actively allowed to enter. Um, and so that sort of uh, cut down on the number of services that we're able to provide, um, as well as the juvenile detention center. We have a relationship with them as well. And so I think it really depends on the uh, the prison or the jail, and it's establishing that relationship on what is acceptable to them. In Nevada County, I also worked with the Nevada County 
uh, correctional facility there, the county jail, um, and we provided books to inmates. It was a social justice campaign that we actually started as a book to action campaign uh, one year, and then it continued after that. Uh, but it took really understanding how they would allow us to come in, what access we would be able to provide. Um, and, and so it's really, uh, you have to establish that relationship with your local correctional facility. Wonderful. Uh, that, that's a good segue, Yolande, in terms of uh, uh, you having the floor. And I will, t- I will tell you, I did talk to Greg Lucas about this uh, in passing. And so maybe we should follow up uh, at some point to talk about this a little further in terms of trying to make it a little more systematic, right, and providing that support and facilitating those relationships. So but with that being said, uh, Yolande, you, you have the floor. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, And I will, um, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Chow, for um, really putting this all together. And to all of our panelists, you know, I I know growing up, I was a library kid. I spent a lot of hours. My mother was like, get out of your room and stop reading. Um, But I have to tell you, there is not one library. And I grew up in the city of Chicago. Um, and then moved out to the suburbs of Chicago. And I do not recall ever coming in contact with an African-American librarian who looked like me in that process. And so for me, this is a great celebration of Black History Month that we have come so far that this panel is filled with African-American librarians who are successful. So thank you all for being here. Um, And then I'm gonna go ahead and I guess share my screen here because I did uh, just put together a few slides. um, Oops, here, go back. That I wanted to just um, kind of go over a few of my experiences. And I've had, uh, like many of you, a variety of jobs in different libraries as I came to the position that I'm in now as director of libraries for Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Um, As I mentioned, I've served as the county librarian in Nevada County and also worked uh, as a library manager in LA um, and also worked in Dubai. So I've had a little experience with international populations as well. So kind of in my experiences, um, what I really have found is the most important thing in serving uh, Black populations is you really have to enjoy it. And I think many of you touched on this, like you have to have passion. I think Wanda said this, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. I'm gonna tell you something, I've worked with African-American communities Uh, Latino communities, and they know in a heartbeat if you're sincere or if you are not. And if you are not sincerely committed and passionate about serving the community, you probably should just move on um, because you're not going to be successful. They really are searching for people who really truly want to connect with them and truly help them. And so enjoy, you must enjoy it. Um, And then I think you also have to ensure that there is a benefit to the community because you can hold all the programs you want. And if there's really no benefit for the community, they are just not going to come out. Um, So I'm also going to talk a little bit about a couple of things I've got here. Survey says, which people have mentioned kind of surveying and I think about it in a different way. Um, but then also taking action and just sharing a few big resources. Um, But I want you all to know that there are literally hundreds of resources out there that can help you through the process. So um, under the the guise of Survey Says, I really think it's important, and uh, I think many of our panelists have mentioned this today, that you ask your community what they need and you listen to what it is that they need. And I know that as librarians, that can sometimes be difficult because we may not be at the circulation desk and we're not out on the floor all the time. We may be in an office where we're planning programs or doing outreach, but I think it's important that you establish a relationship with your paraprofessional staff so that when people walk in the door and they're checking out materials, they can say, hey, you know, a lot of people are checking out books on Alzheimer's. (laughs) Maybe we should be doing a program for our community on Alzheimer's and how it affects the African-American community. So you really have to 
uh, work with your other team members to ensure that you are asking, but also they are asking and you're listening to what your community needs are. I also really am a firm believer in looking at and surveying the community partners landscape. Um, for me, um, I just recently arrived here in Santa Cruz. Um, I've been the director here about two months. And one of the first things that I did was I had the opportunity where I reached out to the NAACP was holding event. They wanted us to do a table. And I said, yep, we're doing a table for NAACP. We're going out there and we're setting up our booth. From going out to that event with NAACP, uh, I was uh, invited to a luncheon to meet a number of other organizational leaders here in the community. Um, that led to the United Way. Um, the United Way right now is doing a campaign around African-American health. And what's really interesting is um, one of the first things that I noticed in our survey numbers, because we're working on a strategic plan, that African-American population here is under 2%. So they're referred to as other <laughs> in, in any survey results. So be careful with that because we're not other, we are black, <laughs> we are African-American and we need to be served, right? And if we're always lumped as other, then we're not recognizing that there is an African-American community that needs to be served. Um, working and partnering with United Way has been a big piece of what I've been trying to establish in the short time that I've been here. And they are working on a series called Black Health Matters, right, where they're talking about health outcomes. African-Americans historically don't hike. We're in an area that is great scenic beauty, lots of national parks. The state library here is doing a national park program where you can check out a, a park pass and get in for free. And as African-Americans, that's not something that we do, right? I grew up uh, camping and because my dad and his family uh, came out of the South. And so I spent my summers camping and hiking. So I know about that, but a lot of other African-Americans have not had those opportunities. And so they have scheduled like Two weeks ago, I went on a hike that United Way sponsored where they had a retired park ranger who facilitated, here's how you do a day hike, here's, here's how you wanna prepare. So making sure that you're surveying who your community partners are in the landscape and then becoming involved in the other organization's business will help you to be able to serve the black community better. I encourage you to sort of what I call reach out and lean in, and that is going to other government agencies, educational institutions. Um, I cannot tell you when I was in uh, when I was serving as a librarian in LA. Um, one of the neighborhoods that I worked in uh, was largely African American and Latino. And I reached out to the sheriff's department because it was a high crime neighborhood. And everyone who would come into the library would tell, tell me as the library manager, oh, somebody's car just got stolen or something, you know, that the preschool got broken into. And I said, well, why don't we as a neighborhood and community do something about it, right? And they were, well, I don't know what to do. Well, I reached out to the LA County sheriffs and I said, hey, let's start having some community conversations here at the library. And I'll tell you the first time people walked in, what they said was, why are the police here? <laughs> are you trying to get us arrested? No, I'm trying to get you to have a community conversation with the very people who can help you. And so by establishing that relationship, we were able to reduce crime in the neighborhood because first people started calling me <laughs> to report crime and I had to tell them, no, call the sheriff, right? and they were able to establish a rapport with sheriff's deputies, right? By having those monthly community conversations. Um, reaching out to, uh, we know who those kids are who come in our library every day, right? And so going out and meeting with principals of schools and teachers, and I've actually gone out and negotiated with teachers and said, hey, will you give students extra credit if they come to this program? Because I believe so strongly in it being beneficial. Um, and I've had principals who have said to me, hey, we've got some students who are doing detention. <laughs> we send them over to the library for your program instead. So here's a great opportunity instead of penalizing students, 
sending them to a place where they can become educated and they can grow, right? And they can learn. It's better than sending them to a correctional facility, right? Let's try and bring them in that way. Um, numerous kids who all need volunteer service hours, I would have them come to the library and I'd go out and, and I have, this is a double duty um, philosophy that I have, right? Because I'm going to go out and I'm going to uh, hook you with, you need the service credit hours. So I'm going to give you the service credit hours for coming and helping us set up programming at the library. But I'm also talking to you while you're there, as Janae said, about what it looks like for you to become a librarian, right? You may, you probably haven't thought about that at that age um, when you're in middle school or when you're in high school, but taking the moment to say, we'll give you volunteer service credit hours, but we need you to come in and do some things, right? And that's how we start talking about what librarianship is and it as a possible career path. So, I've offered internships, um, paid and unpaid, um, and largely paid internships are always better um, because I think that satisfies an economic piece for members of our community that they may not have the opportunity. It gets them the job skills that they need. I always make my interns interview for their positions because, right, fill out a job application, right? I make them go through the whole process because that's a part of helping my community to be able to achieve and get jobs in the future. Um, and then I talked a little bit about this uh, in Nevada County. I really worked on making sure that I researched important historical events for the area and how African-Americans played a role in those events. And then I connected with people in the community who knew the history. And that might be a historical society. It might be the local community college. But uh, whoever that is, you want to establish those connections. And then I may not be having the program at my library. They may be having the program. But I want to support them and make sure that we're helping to promote those programs and services for our community. So again, I talked a little bit about hosting community conversations, which I think are a big part of it, especially when you've got tough conversations to have. Uh, when I worked at Chicago Public, uh, one of the branches that uh, I worked at, we held a community conversation around the POV, the, the PBS POV series on the Young Lords. There were issues with uh, gangs in the neighborhood. And so rather than uh, try to avoid the issue, I really wanted to bring the issue to focus for that community. So we invited the local adult school class members. Again, this was going out and talking to teachers and principals. And I got high school students who were able to get extra credit for coming to that program, as well as community members who lived in the neighborhood and were faced with the issues of crime and violence. And I brought them all together to really hold an honest conversation and dialogue. And there was a, an amazing amount of sort of light bulbs that went off uh, in that program. Um, and I think it was a very successful program that the community, uh, that neighborhood really it resonated with them and they continued to come back and want more based on that. So again, your programming can be, and I've listed some different things. So I think everybody here has talked about on this, the panel has talked about doing social justice programs, health and well-being, environment and climate. Again, those food deserts and how we are um, uh, even down to the trees. How many trees do we have in our neighborhood, right? Um, so Again, I, I think somebody's mentioned being intentional, and that's why I have be deliberate down here. You have to really be deliberate about the programming that you're doing. It has to be consciously driven and intentional. Um, and that goes back to a lot of those conversations that we had about what you really need for your community and what you need to uh, live a better, healthier life. So with that, I have, again, a few of the 
larger, more well-known resources here, but many of them have uh, sort of local chapters. So I encourage you to reach out to those local chapters, make those connections. Again, lean into what they're doing, go to their stuff, because that's what's going to help you build a network of other community leaders who can help you provide great services to the Black community. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Yolan. Very wonderful remarks, really great advice. Um, let me include uh, the link to our symposium website. All recordings, all slides, all resources shared here today will be posted uh, on that site. Um, and we will also be uh, delivering the recording uh, transcription and summary of uh, today's proceedings as well. Part of our intent and recognition is that um, the YouTube recording may very well be much more popular uh, than our actual symposium, given how busy uh, everyone is. So um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for your time, everyone uh, in, uh, in attendance. Feel free again to uh, recognize the, the wonderful work that uh, was done uh, in, in, in uh, all, all that was said here. Um, so I also want, in, in conclusion, um, please uh, consider joining us for our future symposium. So we, we have Women's Heritage Month on March 22nd from 12 to 2. Uh, we have Deaf Culture and Community on April 21st from 1 to 3. All of this will be posted. Uh, and that one will be largely led in uh, ASL, American Sign Language. Um, we also have Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month uh, featuring Patty Wong, uh, current ALA president, and also Michael Lambert, uh, the uh, director of the San Francisco Public Library. Um, again, I thank you for your time, uh, panel. I thank you for sharing your wisdom and ideas, uh, and we truly are stronger together. So with that being said, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and I look forward to going to battle with many of you uh, on many issues uh, uh, in our field. So thank you.